Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. My guest this week is Harold Horgan, president of the York Group. The company has been focused for many years on working with ISVs to develop strategies for expanding their channels. Over the last 12 years, Harold and his team have worked with Microsoft and its partners as the company has refocused on the idea of partner-to-partner relationships. In the last few years, the focus has been on driving higher cloud technology consumption. Whereas Microsoft once chased the online behemoths for cloud business, the company came around a few years ago, Harold says, to the realization that legacy ISVs are a key player in bringing clients to Azure and partner programs should encourage that group to be more productive. Horgan believes the latest efforts with one commercial partner will bring more discipline to Microsoft's channel efforts, but not without some risks both for Microsoft and its ISV partners as they evolve their respective channel strategies. Okay, Harold Horgan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Jason. Sitting here in a sunny and a very warm Seattle this week. It's going to be it's supposed to be 99 here by uh, tomorrow. Wow, that's very warm. Uh, that's a little unusual, right? It is. Luckily, it is very unusual because Seattleites aren't all that big on air conditioning. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, here on the East Coast, we're having it uh, a little easier. I think it's only, only mid-80s today. Uh, so we're talking uh, just about what three weeks, uh, three weeks beyond the Inspire event, and it's still a, a big talking, uh, big talking point, big focus for discussions. A lot, a lot to uh, take away from that event, I think, uh, and uh, a lot that's very relevant to the kind of work that you do at, at uh, the York Group. Yeah, it certainly is. And this is a brief background. The York Group has been focused on working with ISVs, enterprise software ISVs, business-to-business companies, for about 25 years. We worked extensively on their go-to-market strategies with a focus on uh, channel development, taking companies internationally. So over the years, we've learned uh, a lot of things that that, uh, work and all of the things that don't work, and there are quite a few of those. And we've been partnering with Microsoft for the last 12 years. in terms of uh, working with their partners, we've developed a lot of content that's available on different websites on Channel 9, and we work with uh, with a lot of their partners directly on building out their channel strategy and also helping them recruit partners in strategic markets. You know, Microsoft has, has uh, as you know, Microsoft has really um, encouraged partners to work together and do partner-to-partner types of um, types of uh, interactions or, or, or communications uh, for, for a long time. But uh, I don't think it's ever been more stressed or more encouraged than it, was, than it is this year in Microsoft's new you know, fiscal year. Uh, did you take that away from, uh, from, from the, uh, the, the Inspire event as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and we've been on this journey with Microsoft for about 12 years. And we were actually brought in by Microsoft. They found us when they had launched uh, something called Channel Builder about 12 years ago. And that was their first effort to develop an electronic meeting place for partners. And it had some mixed success. Then that evolved into Pinpoint. And now we have uh, Microsoft uh, Partner Center. So but P2P activity has been at least on the agenda for, for quite a while. It was a uh, very big 10, 12 years ago, and then it died out because the Microsoft changed its focus away from ISVs to being more focused on the channel partners because that's where revenues were recognized. And then as Azure emerged uh, for quite a while, the focus was on trying to identify the next Facebook, the next Google, uh, Google the next Uber, the, 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 the big startups that would drive a lot of consumption. And uh, for a number of years, ISVs, I think, felt like they were walking through the desert on their own without a lot of care and feeding from uh, Microsoft. That started to change about three years ago, and I think Satya really deserves the credit for that because uh, he comes at it from the enterprise perspective. He understands the importance of the enterprise market, and he understands the importance of enterprise ISVs. And as they were running the Azure metrics, they also recognized that a lot of the workloads were coming from the traditional legacy on-premise ISVs. They were moving their applications to the cloud, and they were bringing their clients with them. So they're finding that at one point, 65 to 70 percent of the Azure consumption from ISVs were from legacy ISVs that weren't getting a lot of attention. So about three years ago, there was a real refocusing of time, energy, resources on ISVs. And uh, and I think that the reorganization around one commercial partner is a natural evolution of that philosophy of uh, encouraging the ISVs to expand their business, to expand their business through the Microsoft ecosystem. And I think for the first time in at least the last 10 years, we're seeing a very disciplined, structured approach to helping partners within the Microsoft uh, partner ecosystem 
find each other and work with each other on a more productive basis. You know, that's interesting. Uh, it, it seems like the, the challenge hasn't gone away, but Microsoft's really just uh, uh, maybe putting more uh, more focus on it or, or, or maybe perhaps, well, like you said, not encur- not that they're just starting to encourage it, but m- maybe encouraging it in a way that, do you think it's, a, do you think it's more, um, more constructive than it has been in the past? No, absolutely, absolutely. And one of the big benefits of being a Microsoft partner is the size of the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. At any given time, there are roughly seventy to 80,000 ISVs that have business or enterprise applications and a lot more that have consumer apps and games and, and those types of applications. And then you have somewhere between four and 500,000 channel partners, depending on how you define channel partners. So it's natural. And uh, the more Microsoft ISVs can work with Microsoft channel partners, it reinforces the Microsoft brand and it becomes an easier route to market for ISVs. One of the challenges in the past within the Microsoft ecosystem is that revenues have always been recognized at the local level. So uh, each of the subsidiaries has operated as a silo. If you were sitting there as an ISV in Denmark and you had 95% of your revenues from outside of Denmark, all the all that the Microsoft Denmark was concerned about was the 5% that was recognized in Denmark. So they would much rather help an ISV expand through SIs and other channel partners in Denmark than trying to help them in other markets. And because revenues are recognized or were recognized at the local level, there was no incentive for Microsoft partner account managers in other markets to really collaborate and work with ISVs that were coming into their market. With one commercial partner, a lot of those artificial silos, they weren't artificial, they were really uh, uh, formalized, but those silos will start to disappear. And it will make it a lot easier for Microsoft partners to work across borders with partners, and there will be a compensation and incentive system in place for Microsoft account managers to make that happen. And that's a, that's a big change. I got, yeah, I got the sense that that was a result of um, having someone like Ron Huddleston who's coming in from the outside with you know, enough leadership, uh, you know, heft behind, you know, support to, to, uh, given to him to say, these are the things that coming from the outside don't look like they make sense. Um, if, if from, from me to come in and do, do a job, uh, do you think other people have that? Do you have that perspective? Is that, is that, uh, how you saw it? Yes. And I think, you know, the one commercial partner program, the way it's designed on paper makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I think that there will still be a lot of institutional challenges and barriers to actually making it work on the ground. And they're trying to push this through in the way they are changing roles. So they're uh, moving field sellers into roles of what they call channel managers. Channel managers will be mandated with helping ISVs and SIs that have really good solutions, whether those are, are IP solutions or they might be services solutions that can be applied in other markets to help them open up contacts with account executives and uh, customers in other markets. So it's much more of a an overall approach. Uh, Microsoft, but Microsoft's a huge organization with a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of built-in inertia, uh, so it's probably going to take time for that to move uh, move forward and really work efficiently. But I think they're definitely headed in the right direction. It uh, it really helps. I think, looking from an ISV perspective, it helps them with creating opportunities in other in other marketplaces, and there won't be a a compensation barrier uh, to people locally helping ISVs from other markets. The channel managers, the way that is going to be organized, will be compensated on the revenues that are generated from the local geography that they work in, not from where the ISV is based. So a, a um, an account manager, a channel manager in Dayton, Ohio, that gets an inquiry from a Norwegian or Swedish or an Albanian ISV that has a really cool solution and think that that solution can add value to their local customers. Uh, will be mandated to help those ISVs get in with those customers through the account executives. So a a lot of those barriers that have existed in the past will go away. Uh, The other thing that that, uh, I think will drive a lot of the P2P activity is the emergence of AppSource. AppSource as the primary dominant platform for the the marketplace for Microsoft-based applications. It's still early days for AppSource, but it's clear that Microsoft is really making this a strategic initiative. 
And what this means is that an ISV that posts their, their application on AppSource will start to get inquiries from around the world uh, because AppSource will be heavily marketed by, by uh, uh, Microsoft as that window, that, that portal to uh, Microsoft solutions. And as ISVs start to get these inquiries, that's going to make it more uh, more compelling for them to identify channel partners that can help provide the local support. So what are some of the things that you're recommending uh, ISVs do now uh, in response to some of these changes? Is it, is it too early for them to really start taking action or not? No, I think they knew, they really do need to start taking action and start planning through what their approach is going to be. And because of that, source, they will start to get inquiries from markets that they weren't targeting as strategic markets. It could be a, a U.S.-based ISV really focused on the U.S. Uh, on the U.S. And over the next uh, year, two years, three years, there's going to be a steady increase, a real uptick in inquiries from markets around the world. And uh, so an ISV will need to make the decision, well, do we just block those out? And that makes it more difficult for them politically within Microsoft to host their application on, on App Stores. And if they are now going to start listening to inquiries from customers in different parts of the world, they really need to think through how are we going to support them. Now, if they have a product that is self-service, that can be provisioned from the web, that can be installed by the customer, uh, accessed by the customer, the trans sales transaction can take place electronically, then that's fine. Then AppSource really functions as a, as a marketplace for those types of applications. But when selling applications into an enterprise market, in most cases, they're selling into a complex existing environment. And that means that their solution may, uh, may have to be integrated with other backend uh, applications. There may be data migration. There may be process reengineering. There may be all kinds of services attached to having that application work well in an enterprise in, uh, environment. And that's going to be very difficult for an ISV to support from their local local uh, place of business. So it will make it more compelling for ISVs to find partners in different parts of the world so that can, that can represent them. And then that opens up the, the question of do they want partners that are implementation partners or do they want partners that are going to be proactive in selling and marketing their solution? And there's a big difference between the two. It will be relatively simple for an ISV to find a, an SI or a VAR in Brazil or Indonesia or Australia when they have an opportunity that that local partner can work on. Well, what will be more difficult is converting that local partner to being proactive in investing their own time and resources in marketing the solution, supporting the sales process, and handling the implementation. That is a different business model. Yeah, and that's something you talked about in the interview you did uh, with my colleague Dan. That there really are those, I guess, two two kinds, two primary kinds of of partners that an ISV can can engage with. Um, you suggest a very structured approach to sort of laying out that business case. If you're an ISV talking to, I guess, prospect prospective. Uh, resellers of your solution, right? Um, yeah. Is, 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 it, is it that very regimented, or not regimented, but sort of very structured and, and, and well thought out um, case that's, that's really critical for making those decisions uh, if, you're, if you're an ISV sort of trying to identify uh, partners? Yeah, I think so. Uh, whether an ISV is proactively looking for, for partners and wanting to recruit partners in strategic markets, or they're just fielding inquiries from partners. Because what will happen is that there will be uh, an SI in Brazil that is doing a large deployment for a local company, and they need specific technologies to complete the overall solution. And uh, they'll go through AppSource to find the solutions that, that meet the requirements for the customer. They will contact those ISVs wherever they happen to be and say that we're working on this big deal with, uh, with, with, the, with the oil company in Brazil, Petrobras, I think it is, and uh, your solution fits and we'd like to include that. <laughs> and by the way, we would like to become your partner. And at that point, the ISV needs to make a decision. Is this going to be a single transaction opportunity? And they work with the SI to support them in that transaction. Or do they think that this can be a more of a long-term relationship with the sustainable, repeatable sales? If it's the latter, then they need to have a model in place to make sure that they this is a good fit for the SI. Now, their solution might be a good fit for that one particular solution, that one one implementation that they're working on, but it may not be something that appeals to the SI to go out and, and do on a repeatable basis. So the idea behind the modeling is to have a very clear understanding of what a transaction looks like 
from the from the customer's perspective and from the, the the partner's perspective. So it's more than just the discount that they might get from the from the license from the subscription. It's going to be the services that are necessary to complete a successful implementation and deployment. In many cases, that's going to be the bigger part of the transaction. So if there are services required, then that means that the partners also need to have the skills, the certifications, the competencies uh, to do that without having to go through a lot of training. So the idea behind doing the modeling is for the ISV to walk through what a typical transaction would look like from the customer's perspective. What are they paying for as far as the, the license? What's the average sales cycle going to be? Uh, what are the services necessary in order to successfully deploy the solution? And then uh, are there any other third-party solutions that get pulled? through will there be a dynamics license that gets pulled through is there azure consumption are there other third-party software products that get pulled through and from the isv's perspective the more that transaction aligns with the business model that an existing partner has the more successful the relationship will be so by modeling this out ahead of time it allows an isv to build a very structured scorecard so when they get that call from an SI in Brazil they can walk them through and say well do you have the following uh, competencies are you selling actively into these vertical markets and they can match that up against the business model that they developed and it shortens the conversation because now the ISV will have a very clear understanding of whether this partner has the potential to be a repeatable partner more of a strategic partner uh, producing sustainable revenues or is this partner going to be a transactional partner for this particular uh, opportunity you know, it's interesting. I think I, as you say that, I think back to um, f people who work for ISV organizations that I know and that I have conversations with over time. And there are definitely a few who, who do talk about some of those issues in terms of, you know, I guess you'd say thinking strategically about their um, the, the, the channel for, for their own solutions and, and supporting the partners who work with them. Because obviously lots of ISVs have um, you know, bigger or smaller um, sort of sets of, of those reselling partners. Um, there aren't too many, though, who really can talk about it um, in depth about what they're doing. And there's even a smaller portion of those who then sort of tie that back to um, not just sort of working with, uh, like, let's say, VARs in the dynamic space, if that's if they're selling to, you know, to a Dynamics 365 audience, but then also tying that back to Microsoft's partner organization and, you know, trying to look for ways to kind of combine the, you know, the strategic value that they can that they can get out of sort of their Microsoft relationship and the and the value of, you know, having a solid relationship with uh, with resell or with Microsoft resellers as well. It yeah. seems like a it's a rare combination. Yeah, J Jason, that is a really good point that you that you raised because. Uh, that's one of the things that when we talk to ISVs and they're moving into new markets, and it's that call it triangulation that you just mm, referred to. Okay, yep. It's a triangulation between an ISV, a channel partner, and Microsoft in the local marketplace. So, uh, in order to get access to the field sellers and to get easier access to the Microsoft customers, uh, it's much better if the local partner is a managed partner in that geography. If they're a managed partner, they already have a strategic relationship with Microsoft. So if it's in Australia or Brazil or in Albania, they, they have that relationship already. And that means that they have easier access to get to those those customers. Now, the, the, the channel manager program that Microsoft is putting together on paper will make it easier for unknown ISVs to get access to new customers and account executives for those customers. But the reality will be that we'll still follow the same chain of command, that a, a managed ISV will get uh, uh, more easily get access to the channel managers and their uh, their accounts. So when an ISV that may not be managed in their local geography is moving into a new market and they want a strategic relationship, it is so much better for them to identify channel partners that already have that relationship with Microsoft. Where and when we're dealing with with uh, uh, this actually works across any board. But let's just talk about uh, companies coming into the U.S. Going in and looking at the different regions and districts and, and matching up the ISVs with where the uh, Microsoft Technology Centers are, for example, because that's a great place to hold events. And if it's a managed partner in the U.S. that the ISV from Sweden is working with, they will be much more uh, readily able to – talk to Microsoft, setting up an event where Microsoft invi invites some of their accounts, the uh, channel partner invites some of their accounts, and they do a, a tri-party event where the ISV comes in and they speak, Microsoft comes in and speaks, the channel partner speaks, and maybe they bring in a, an outside third party like Gartner, a, a, a research firm, to add some more credibility to the event. And that can become a very powerful way to introduce a new technology into a new market. 
Sure. Uh, another area I, I was just curious of, of how you, uh, if you had any observations on, go, again, going back to to Inspire and maybe in the time since then. I mean, even just this week, I've been um, talking to different folks in the, in the Dynamics channel, uh, especially, who are expressing some, I don't know if concern is the right word, but but uh, they're they're looking at their own strategy and they're, or they're looking at the strategy of ISVs they work with. In one, one case, it was a partner of our I was talking to and saying, how are the VAR, how are the ISVs going to, or if it's an ISV himself, how am I going to react to the changes Microsoft is putting in place for uh, their products? And I, I didn't, I don't bring that up to sort of make it a, 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 a sort of a feature-based uh, question about the Dynamics products themselves, but um, there seems to be a lot of sort of reaction and sort of uh, uh, wa watching and trying to trying to adapt right now. Um, did you have you picked up on on that, or have you made any? Do, do you ever make recommendations to ISVs when they um, are trying to adapt their approach based on where Microsoft's going on the sort of on the product side? Oh, certainly, and it's uh, it always makes sense to align the product positioning and the platform that it's built on with Microsoft's priorities. So in the past, and even now, SQL has always been uh, a big part of Microsoft priorities. Azure, of course, Azure consumption and Office 365 uh, activation. So anytime an ISV can align the customer benefits with Microsoft's uh, stated objectives, then it makes it easier to find the partners. Uh, it makes it easier to align with Microsoft resources. Uh, it's not a requirement, uh, but it certainly makes life uh, easier. Um, we're going through this a similar type of a conversation right now. We're working increasingly working with Microsoft's uh, LSPs, the licensed solutions providers, uh, the companies like uh, SH. SHI, uh, CDW, Insight, Software One, the companies that handle large volumes of Microsoft licenses. They also do the same for the other major vendors, Adobe, Citrix, VMware. And uh, one of the things that, that, that we're talking to them about is changing their ISV strategy to work with smaller and mid-sized ISVs that can provide a higher gross margin. But from the LSP perspective, as channel partners for Microsoft, the big drivers for them are also Office 365 activation and Azure consumption. So as we're going through and building out this ISB profile, one of the important things that they look at is, can this solution help drive Azure consumption that goes under the account of the LSP? Will it help them drive Office 365 activation? Because the financial benefits that they get from being a high volume Microsoft partner in those areas is fairly significant. So, uh, if that answers your question, absolutely. Uh, to the extent that an ISV can align their product strategy, the platform, with Microsoft's uh, objectives, especially for a fiscal year, the easier it will be to find the partners that are aligned with Microsoft in the local marketplace and get some additional support from Microsoft in doing it. What about some of the large, uh, I guess you call them, uh, you know, sort of software distributors out there, the, um, uh, you know, the uh, Ingram, Ingram Micros of the world and, and others like that that are sort of have their own very have entered the Microsoft space and maybe even uh, invested more heavily in the last couple of years in, in becoming Microsoft uh, partners of Microsoft, but they have sort of very sort of well rehearsed or, 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 or you know practices in place for how they handle um, you know the sa the sale and distribution of sort of uh, ISV sol solutions that they that they you know sort of push to their own. Uh, their own channels is is that uh, something that's on your radar no i'm in fact i'm not very optimistic about the future for the big uh, the big distributors the disties mm -hmm. they because the 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 value that they have provided traditionally is they function as a logistics platform and they function as a bank so they they have a, a very sophisticated mm -hmm. infrastructure for the physical distribution of products well as more and more solutions move to the cloud there'll be less and less need for physical distribution you're no longer selling boxes of software it's all going to be online uh, you're selling fewer and fewer servers because people are using the cloud there will still be endpoints there will still be physical distribution but that that is a de declining business model the other value that the distributors traditionally have provided is the financing function uh, that they will that they have the strength to be able to pay the 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 ISVs uh, faster than the ISVs would be get it, getting it themselves. So they they aggregate orders. So a, a VAR would place an order for ten different products. The the uh, the the uh, uh, distributor would aggregate all of those and issue a single uh, invoice to to the uh, to the VAR. And uh, so their role as a bank also goes away or starts to diminish. If people are, are paying on a subscription basis and they're paying up front, there's no 
credit terms anymore. There's no need to provide that financing. So the question for the DISTs is whether they can find a value-added business model quickly enough that offsets what will be a steady erosion and decline in the revenues from the physical distribution and, and financing of these solutions. And as we move into more and more online solutions, um, I don't see, personally, I don't see that they provide the same level of value that they provided in, in, in the, uh, the good old days. So I think that increasingly they will be displaced by direct sales. Uh, ISVs working directly with channel partners using platforms like AppSource as a distribution platform and with LSPs that start to expand their business model to include the, the smaller mid-sized ISVs. So I'm not really optimistic as to what role the – I don't think that DISTs are going to have the same dominant role in distribution that they've had for the last 20 to 30 years. The business models are changing so quickly. And I haven't seen the, their ability to adapt at scale in a way that, that uh, provides them with a, a really rosy future. Interesting observation, and, and I agree. I have much more kind of limited view of, of, of what those what DISTs are doing. But um, in the areas that I do watch, it does seem like Microsoft had really high hopes that they could – you know, take on some of the newest cloud solutions and very quickly push them out to their their affiliates and and, and their partner channel to start uh, to start you know let's say getting uh, you know Dynamics solutions or even you know uh, even Office 365 uh, into a lot of sort of SMB clients very very quickly and I think those it just wasn't uh, at least in the first year or so um, didn't move nearly as fast as I think Microsoft had hoped for and. Uh, no, I think part of the part of the challenge is the structural uh, mm -hmm. the challenge around the compensation. It's the it's a margin margin uh, sharing, and the, the DCs get their whatever their gross number is, their high their 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 large number from the the ISVs for handling all of this distribution. It's up to them how they then then share those margins with the channel partners. So for a channel partner, instead of now selling uh, uh, on-premise stuff where they get their margins, they get paid up front, and when they're moving into cloud applications, they, the margins go down, You're talking about the, in, in absolute terms, and very often a lower percentage than they were getting before, and uh, you're also looking at a deferred payment stream. So the, the uh, in order to recruit VARs through a DISTI model, uh, become, it becomes very difficult to do that because the compensation structure doesn't make it very attractive for uh, VARs and channel partners to work through DISTIs. Uh, what we've seen in some cases, and this is anecdotal, uh, is that, that the DISTIs have been keeping larger margins on cloud-based applications and subscriptions than they did for the on-premise stuff, uh, further reducing the margin available to the channel partners. And then uh, channel partners live on margin. And when that starts to go away, they find other ways of doing business. Yeah, that is one of the I, that's another complaint I've heard a couple times, in uh, even just this just this week in, in in a couple of conversations is that's a big concern. Not uh, I wouldn't say just for distance, but for everybody. Um, and I think once you go to that level where you're sort of two two steps removed from a vendor uh, as a as a reseller, um, that that probably does become a big concern. Yeah, it, it does. It's uh, been just for. If you look at this from a from a channel perspective, I think that over the next five to ten years, there's going to be a, a fundamental repositioning of channel partners. Microsoft mm -hmm. has been pushing this uh, because the margins are going down. The, the small and mid-sized ISVs are still competing for mindshare. And this is an important consideration when looking at the, uh, the partner margins. Um, a lot of ISVs, when they move to the cloud, think, well, gee, Microsoft has cut back the, the discount. All the major vendors are cutting back mm -hmm. the discount to their partners, so we'll do the same thing. Well, it's one thing when you're Microsoft and partners rely on that business. Uh, they can mandate that. They can dictate that. But it's a small or mid-sized ISV. You're competing for Mindshare. That, uh, the channel partners that you're going to recruit – haven't they have a choice of where they want to spend their time and resources? And uh, in many cases, partners, channel partners, are still focused on the on-premise solutions because that's where they get their 40% discount. Sure. That's where they get uh, services. And when a when a, a small to mid-sized ISV goes out to market, they have to make it economically interesting for those channel partners to take on a new solution. And going to those partners saying, oh, we're not going to pay you 40% upfront on an on-prem. We're going to pay you 20 points or 30 points uh, on a deferred revenue stream uh, eliminates any economic incentive that the channel partner has to work with that ISV. 
ISVs today in the in the small to mid-sized ISVs, whether they're dy dynamics or any other uh, uh, part of the uh, Microsoft ecosystem, uh, have a challenge today. They are, they are going to have to maintain the same discount structure for the partners that they do for on-premise. It's not sustainable over time. It will change. But today, they're still fighting for mindshare, and that mindshare is going to be based on the gross margin contribution that a partner sees from a transaction. And uh, and to the extent that, that small to mid-sized ISVs feel that they can follow in the footsteps of, of the big guys, and they go to market saying, yeah, you're only getting 20%, but it's a recurring 20%. Uh, it simply doesn't make any mm -hmm. uh, sense for the, uh, the partners to do that. And uh, in terms of the work that your group is doing um, today, if you maybe think back to, say, I don't know, 10 years ago or uh, 12 years ago, maybe when you, were, when you were doing, like you said earlier, some of the earliest work with, with Microsoft on, on uh, services for, for, um, for vendors, um, are, are there any other ways that the way that you're interacting with, um, well, not Microsoft, but like, let's say, um, ISVs and their partner channel, um, you know, things that you're working with them on that have really changed over that time um, that are maybe indicative of, of where we are today? Yes, yeah, so, so there's, there's been a huge shift in partners' willingness to take on new applications and invest in them. If we go back even 15 years in Western Europe, there were still a lot of channel organizations that were interested in looking at new stuff in order to grow their business. And they're willing to, to make an investment in new solutions coming into the marketplace. Today, every, every partner that's out there has been in business for 5, 10, 15, 30 years in some cases, and they have a steady business. They have some recurring revenues from services, contracts, they have their customer base, and what they're looking at is just upselling uh, to the existing customers. There is, uh, there is a huge reluctance on the part of channel partners today to make an investment in a new product selling into, uh, into their geography. They don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not looking at uh, they're not looking at that that opportunity to grow. Uh, they want things that fold into their existing uh, way of doing business, their existing processes, and uh, that makes it much more difficult for an ISV. So that's the the biggest change over the last 15 years has been the the increasing reluctance on the channel partners to make an investment in sales and marketing of new products in the established markets. We still see uh, the willingness to do this for selected solutions in places like the Middle East, in Africa, uh, parts of LATAM in the emerging markets uh, that aren't, aren't going to be at the top of the list for ISVs as they expand. So in some of those markets, channel partners are still actively looking for new things because they don't have ready access to them. Um, any other sort of recommendations that you're making uh, more generally to those ISVs who are facing this Facing the the current landscape as opposed to what they might have expected, uh, like like you said, ten, fifteen, even thirty years ago. Yeah, look at look at your solution and look at what it takes to install it. If it's a self service product, then you can have a very broad base. There's nothing wrong with having what we call portfolio partners. Uh, that as long as it doesn't require any real investment by the ISV to train the partner or to support the process in the sales process or the implementation. If it's all self-service, then go ahead and populate the market with thousands of partners and the law of big numbers will, will, will take care of it. But once you get into more sophistication and complexity in the sales process and the deployment, you have to be very selective. And uh, in doing that, what we suggest is that companies be very disciplined in working with a very small number of partners that they can build uh, strategic relationships with and avoid the temptation to sign up partners that are portfolio partners or reactive partners, opportunistic partners, because those will suck resources out of the ISV. So in today's environment, you really have to have the commitment from the partners to be the outsourced ISV, if you will, in their local marketplace, assume a lot of the responsibilities that the ISV would have if they were selling directly in their own in their own marketplace. So really make a distinction between the type of technology that you have. Is it self-service? Is it easy to roll out? Not a lot of high touch with the channel partners? Then you can go for a high volume, broad-based channel program. If there's any type of complexity in the sales uh, implementation support of the product, then be very selective, work with a small group of very motivated and well-compensated partners, and you'll be more successful. Great stuff. Well, uh, we're going to link back to uh, the interview that you uh, just did a few days ago with us, because I think that's got even more uh, great insight from you. And thank you so much for taking the time today to uh, to join the podcast and speak with me. 
My pleasure, Jason. It's a really exciting time to be part of the Microsoft ecosystem. Microsoft is really putting a lot of emphasis on P2P, on international expansion. They're making resources available. It's a great time to be an ISV, and uh, we're really yeah, excited to be part of it. Yeah, I, I hope we can uh, we can check in sometime down the road and see how things have uh, have rolled out with some of these new changes because it really is early days for uh, for this new uh, new set of uh, guidelines and, and some of these new dynamics um, uh, of the space. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, Jason. This has been the MSDW Podcast. My thanks to Harold Horgan for joining us today. Please send your feedback to me, jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World signing off.